Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship at First Baptist Church on this beautiful uh, day before Valentine's Day. Gentlemen, make sure you got your stuff ready for tomorrow. It's good to see you all. It's good to be in the house of the Lord together. It's good to be able to gather as the family of God and to worship Him. I want to welcome those who are uh, joining us uh, on the live stream this morning. We are glad that you are here and, and are part of this worship time. I'd like to encourage you to to uh, say hello through the comments section so we can know who's joining us uh, for worship. We always enjoy, I always enjoy going back and checking that to see who uh, was able to, uh, to, to be here with us um, on Sunday mornings. I want to welcome those who are also visiting us. We are so glad that you're here, whether you're visiting us here in person or visiting us online. We, are, we, we hope that you feel at home uh, during this time of worship and that this is a meaningful time of worship for you. Um, if you are here in person and would like to connect with our church, there is a tear-out portion of the bulletin where you can leave contact information, and at the end of the, the service, you can place those in the offering plates that are located here at the front of the sanctuary, and there's uh, one in, in the, ex the exit out uh, towards the Wilson Street side. And uh, if you are joining us uh, on the live stream, I'd like to encourage you, if you uh, are a guest and want to reach out to the church to go to our website, firstbaptistfarmville.org, and you can find contact information there. Uh, we would love to hear from you. Um, I would like to give you a reminder this morning as far as giving of tithes and offerings uh, is concerned. You can give um, with the offering plates, again, that are located here and the one that is located um, out in the vestibule. Additionally, you can uh, give online at firstbaptistfarmville.org. There's a link at the top of the page uh, or you can drop off or mail uh, checks to the office uh, during the week. As far as uh, announcements go, uh, this morning I want to remind you um, to remember whether or not you signed up for the Valentine's Luncheon for the senior adults uh, that is following the service today. That is, is going to be located in the Fellowship Hall. And um, we, uh, we thank our youth for putting on that banquet um, each year. I know that is a very special, um, special thing for our youth and for our senior adults. Um, this evening there is a Super Bowl party for the youth group at 6 p.m. And just a reminder to bring a snack to share. Also, deacons, we have a meeting at 5 p.m. I want to share this morning a video, um, and that's, it's about to come, but I want to give a little bit of a, of a heads up of what it is, a little explanation. Uh, you've probably heard over the past couple of weeks um, about, uh, about some interest in helping some Afghan refugees in their resettlement. Just a brief history of that. Y'all remember back, I believe it was late August, when Afghanistan was shutting down, the Taliban was, was overtaking everything, and um, the United States troops were getting out, and also uh, they were evacuating friends, allies of the United States, people who were Afghan citizens who uh, would, have been, would be targeted by the Taliban. And uh, we've all watched news, um, heard the news of, of horrible things that have happened to people who haven't been able, weren't able to get out of the country. Uh, well, many thousands of them were able to get out. Uh, they were taken to Europe where they were vetted, and those who passed the vetting process were brought to the United States. Uh, where they uh, came to bases, um, they were made sure they were, you know, all the health stuff, protocols, all that stuff was followed, and they were given training on what it's going to be like for them to live in the United States, and they were given the option whether they could, you know, they could leave the base and go ahead and start their life in the United States, or they could wait for sponsors. Many, especially uh, families, decided to wait. They're on military bases right now, and they're waiting for sponsors. And Samaritan's Purse, located in North Carolina, is one of the agencies that is helping in this resettlement process. So there was a meeting this past Sunday at 3 o'clock um, on the 6th. And, uh, yeah, was it yeah, the 6th? And we had a good turnout, um, but we decided uh, to spend a couple of weeks sharing this opportunity and sharing specifically a video so we could see what it looks like. Um, there are churches... Uh, that have undertaken this process and they videoed some of those things and, and this is a, a, a video of that so that we could kind of paint a picture to see what it's like. Um, and then next Sunday, the 20th at 3 p.m., we're going to reconvene with another meeting and hopefully out of that meeting develop a lead team um, that is going to be uh, a minimum of five people who are going to kind of spearhead this and then spread uh, from, from that group, spread to our churches, how can we help uh, with various various things and, and meeting various needs. We're not going to get into all the nitty-gritty of what all of that looks like, but if you want to hear it, you can come to that meeting um, next Sunday at 3 p.m. here, um, and it'll be in our sanctuary. So let's take a moment, check that out really quick. 
Well, some months ago, as we all know, the Taliban took over control of Afghanistan. And in the process of that, many Afghans had to leave the country for safety, fearing for their lives. And quite a few of the evacuees that I've met said that that process was very sudden. It was like a phone call, get to the airport right now. Drop whatever you're doing. Taliban are at the gates. You need to leave now. People have been to a trauma, and uh, most of the people are still in Afghanistan. Like, everyone is not evacuated. Taliban are doing whatever they want. People are starving, are dying, are being murdered. When Samaritan's Purse saw the Afghanistan evacuees coming to America, housed at U.S. military bases, we knew we needed to get involved in resettlement. And we knew that the answer to this would be the church in America. So we've come alongside them to train them, assist, empower, educate, to do everything we can to see the church succeed in welcoming these Afghans into their communities. What happened in Afghanistan just broke my heart. We jumped at the chance to be a part of the resettlement program. Samaritan's first made a way for us to do that which our hearts were crying to do anyhow. So the first time that I heard about the opportunity to come alongside um, Samaritan's Purse was through an email that was sent out to, I believe, the entire church, just letting us know that there would be families coming to our town that were leaving Afghanistan, that there would be needs associated with that. and. I was all in. When they first arrived, they needed a home. They needed food. <laughs> they needed clothes that were appropriate for winters. They needed everything. I'm very thankful to Samaritan Purse, who provided this opportunity to us. Alliance helped us a lot. If we need transportation, shopping, anything, they helped uh, my son to be enrolled in uh, school rented a house for us. They actually invited us to their homes for a meal. I can't imagine what this family is going through. Um, having to leave their country and leave everything. And so I think anyone who has the love of Christ in them would be compelled to help. It is very difficult for everyone who leaves uh, his or her country it is kind of unwanted immigration. Some crises make opportunities. So I think for those people who are here, so this may be opportunity. Um, I'm just really grateful to have the opportunity to get to know them. It's given me a heart for all of the people there. Uh -huh. And just, it's really shown me um, how many people need Jesus. Pastors, churches, I would say to you, be involved. Our people are eager to give monetarily, materially of themselves, and it has helped our church to turn outward. Well, just like the parable of the Good Samaritan in the Bible, we encourage you to help your neighbors, your neighbors that are here from Afghanistan. You'll have impact for eternity through this program. Last summer and seeing it on the news and praying, but at the same time feeling helpless, wishing I could do something to help. And this is an opportunity. This is a way that we can use our hands and feet directly and uh, like that gentleman said um, he says an opportunity to do what our hearts were longing to do already so again I know coming back after worship on a Sunday afternoon at three o'clock might not be ideal for everyone but I think it will be a blessing and um, and, I, and just coming here doesn't mean you're signing up to do it all by yourself or to, to do anything but coming and and knowing how you can pray about it and um, you know, as we're going through a sermon series right now called, called Shaping Our Future, um, I've, I've already talked to, to a few people this past week um, who 
have heard about this opportunity, and they said, this is, I'd love to be involved. And so we're just trying to get the awareness out there so that people can understand what the opportunity is. And again, um, I hope you'll come at three next week. At this time, I want to invite you to join your hearts with me in prayer as we begin this time of worship. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks again for your presence uh, with us this morning. We thank you that wherever we go, that you're there. We thank you that as we uh, give you glory and praise and honor during this time of worship, as we empty ourselves to you, as we lay burdens before you, we, we recognize that you always give back to us. You always fill us up. So we thank you for that. We thank you uh, for the opportunities to give you what you deserve. And we pray that as we, um, as we read the scriptures and as we, um, we think about the, our future and, and what you plan to do with our future, we pray that we would, that, that we would be given the courage um, to follow you into that and to be who, who you've called us to be in this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. morning. Our psalm this morning comes from Psalm 1. All the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or stand around with sinners, or join in with mockers. But they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. They are like trees planted along the river bank, bearing fruit each season. Their leaves never wither, and they prosper in all they do. But not the wicked. They are like worthless chaff, scattered by the wind. They will be condemned by the time of judgment. Sinners will have no place among the godly. For the Lord watches over the path of the godly, but the path of the wicked leads to destruction. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Our Old Testament lesson this morning comes from Jeremiah 17, 5 through 8. This is what the Lord says. Cursed are those who put their trust in mere humans, who rely on human strength and turn their hearts away from the Lord. They are like the stunned shrubs in the desert with no hope for the future. They will live in the barren wilderness in an uninhabited salty land. But blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and confidence. They are like trees planted along a riverbank with roots that reach deep into the water. Such trees are not bothered by the heat or worried by long months of drought. Their leaves stay green and they never stop producing fruit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If I can have the kids come down. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> so I know Pastor Graham has already said what tomorrow is, but tell me what tomorrow is. Valentine's Day. What are you going to do special for it? Anything? Like blank stares. Like I'm supposed to do something? Can you at least tell mom and dad that you love them? Yeah, that's a good one. Make them a little card. Can you make them a card? Those are all really good things to do for somebody you love. Who else loves us? We talk about them all the time. Jesus loves them. Do you know what one of the best and like the greatest Valentine's gifts we've ever been given? Any clues? See this right here? This? What is that? It's the cross. What happened on the cross? What happened? Do we just have a cross up here for anything? No. Why do we have a cross? Who died on the cross for us? Why did he die on the cross for us? Because he what? He loves us. He loves us so much that he gave us his life. Do you know someone else who's died for you and forgiven you of everything you've ever done? I don't. So Jesus is my greatest valentine. Now, to, to celebrate Jesus, do you think Jesus wants like boxes of candy? Do you think he wants hearts and cards and flowers? What do you think Jesus wants from us? You think he wants us to love everybody? Yeah. So he wants us to love everybody. Not just mom, not just dad, not just mom and grandma and granddad. He wants us to love everybody. That means you two have to love each other all the time, even when it's hard. It means you have to love friends that are just getting on your nerves or adults you don't know. Like you have to love everybody in the sanctuary, everybody in the world. And it's hard. Jesus did it. And it's sometimes almost, it, it is impossible for us, but we've got to try. That's what God and Jesus want us to have to give him for Valentine's Day tomorrow and every day. To love each other as much as we can. Okay, can you remember that? So tomorrow tell somebody, whether it's mom, dad, or brothers, that you love them. Okay? This is like, mm. <laughs> Let's pray. Creator God, thank you so much for your son. Thank you for the gift of love that you've given us. Help us to remember to show that love with each and every breath and step we take. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
So we are in a four-week series called Shaping Our Future. You remember we had a live in-game title change last week for those of you who might have been here. We were going to call it, I was going to call it, How God Builds His Church. But I decided to call it Shaping Our Future because the tool that God uses in building His church is us. Amen? We have a part to play in that. And so Shaping Our Future is what this series is. Is about. And there's one verse of scripture that is kind of based on, and it comes from Ecclesiastes 10 10. It says this If the axe is dull and its edge unsharpened, more strength is needed, but skill will bring success. Again, if the axe is dull and its edge unsharpened, more strength is needed, but skill will bring success. In the first part of this series, we're not focusing so much on exactly what this verse in Ecclesiastes is telling us, because it's telling us to sharpen the axe. That's what it's all about, right? If you're going to go and chop down the tree, it's better to do it with a sharp axe than the dull axe, right? So, I mean, we kind of get that. So we're going to talk more about sharpening the axe next week. Uh, but this past, in the first week, the question, the big question was, what is your axe? What is your axe? Did anyone spend some time this week figuring out what your axe is? You know, I talked about several things that we tend to think our axes are last week. And normally, if you were to ask someone, what's your gift? What's your axe? What's your thing that God is working in the world, you know, working with you in the world? They would go straight to, like, the thing that they love to do, like an interest or a hobby or a sport, or maybe straight to their career. And I asked us last week to kind of put those things, if we could, on a back burner, so to speak, and focus a little more on what the Scriptures tell us. And so there were a couple of areas that I tried to encourage us to look at last week, and one of those was the responsibilities and relationships that God has given us. And there's really a a line, a blurred line between an axe and where we're going to go today with relationships and responsibilities. And, you know, I, I task you with thinking about, you know, being a parent and having children that's a, a responsibility that God has given you, or, or your career path, or um, you know, se- several other different areas in life. But then we led to what the scriptures tell us about the greatest acts or greatest tool that God has given us, and that's our spiritual gifts. Tell somebody next to you, you got a gift. You can talk. Tell them you got a gift. Youth, I see the youth here. Tell, tell, your, tell the person next to them, you got a gift. Everyone has a spiritual gift. And and for purposes of this sermon series, I want you to spend some time at some point. Maybe you didn't last week, but maybe this week you're going to, or maybe it's going to be, maybe you're joining us online far off in the future, and you've never thought of yourself as having a spiritual gift. I want you to start thinking in those terms, because every person who's put their faith in Jesus Christ has been given the Holy Spirit, and along with that, the scriptures tell us, come spiritual gifts. And not everyone has the same spiritual gift. I read a list last week, and I'm just going to go slowly through it again. I'm not going to do the whole, the whole definitions of it. But, again, we tend to think, you know, if someone was asked, what's your spiritual gift? Um, they would say, you know, I'm a good dancer. I, I'm, a, I'm a good school teacher. Um, I really enjoy hobby trains. Um, I like watching TV, sports on TV. Uh, it, it could be any number of things that are gifts, that are interests, that are God-given things that are important in our lives, but there's, there's, a, there's a specific set of spiritual gifts that are different than natural talents and giftedness. You, you, you following with me? Is everyone kind of tracking with me? Like, y'all know, I like the bird, I like pigeons, okay? Y'all, and I know that's weird, I took one to youth last week, didn't I? Y'all got to meet Gladiator last week at youth, and I use him as an illustration, but that is not my spiritual gift. I can use my spiritual gifts in my hobby, but that is not like a spiritual gift. That is a God-given interest or, or natural, like a kind of a natural gift, but like I didn't get that when the Holy Spirit came in my life. Like I enjoyed birds before the Holy Spirit, but when the Holy Spirit came in my life and came some of these other gifts then I was able, I'm able to use those in my hobby. For instance, like preaching, like standing before you talking right now, that is, that is not necessarily a spiritual gift. Now, proclaiming the gospel, having wisdom to read the scriptures and to explain those, all of those are spiritual gifts that come together in me standing in the pulpit before you, 
But there are a lot of people who can stand and talk. But not all of them are standing and talking with a spiritual gift. You follow me? I felt this past week that in the first installment of the series, I didn't, with what is your acts, there was a lot I was trying to say, and I wasn't super specific in that. But I think it's super helpful as we move forward that we understand that there are things that we enjoy, there are interests we have, there are things we're good at, but just doing those things in and of themselves, apart from the spiritual gifts that God has given us, do not bear the fruit that God would desire in our lives. You understand? I hope that that makes some sort of sense. But I talked about last week, some people have the the great gift of administration. You are really good at organizing stuff and making it happen. Other people are really good at missions. I've been on mission trips with people who aren't good at missions. It hadn't gone very well. Discernment, having the ability to, to discern. Thankfully, we have people who are... You know, I think about the trustees of our church who have great discernment and people who have make big decisions in our church, great discernment. Those, those people who have great gifts of evangelism, we're all called to share the good news of Christ, but not everyone has the gift of evangelism, right? Some people like break out in hives and they need an EpiPen or something. They're so allergic to evangelism. But that, but that doesn't mean... And if you have the gift of evangelism, like you're just like a person who can go out soul winning. Like I remember a friend in... In, uh, in seminary, he had two guys in his church that had like an old like hippie van. It's, I mean, you know, you know the hippie van. You know what a hippie van is. It's got carpet on the inside and everything. And they would go soul winning on Friday nights. And that was their, like, they loved doing that. And they would actually bear fruit through that. And so they tried to start encouraging other people to come. Other people who didn't necessarily have the gift of evangelism. And it did not go very well. It doesn't mean we aren't called to share our faith. But some people have that gift. Exhortation. How about the gift of faith or the gift of giving, the gift of healing, the gift of helping, the gift of hospitality, the gift of knowledge, leadership, the gift of giving mercy, the gift of prophecy, the gift of serving, the gift of teaching, the gift of shepherding, the gift of wisdom. Those are spiritual gifts that we see described in the scriptures. And uh, we see them in the verse in, in our one of the focal passages we used last week, and I'm going to use again this week that comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. The title of this week's sermon is What is Your Tree? We're going to move from the axe to the tree. And if you haven't defined the axe yet, again, I want to encourage you to spend some time doing that. Spend some time. I gave some some practical strategies last week. One of, the, one of the most practical is ask someone near you. Ask someone close to you. Ask someone who you trust, who, who you know abides in the Lord and, and knows the Lord well. And often they'll see those things in you that you don't see in yourself. Also, just talk to God. Reflect over those things. Ask God to show you what your spiritual gifts are. Additionally to that, there are, if you go on to, to Google and you search spiritual gifts inventory... You can often find uh, online free inventories where you go through. You've got to set aside about 10 to 15 minutes to answer questions. But often it will show you what your spiritual gifts are. Many people have one or two that, are, that, that, that are, are pretty dominant in their lives and two or three that usually support those. And I know for me early in my ministry and going through seminary, they encouraged us to do a, a lot of this self-reflection. And it really was uh, revealing for me about the way that God had made me. God has made every single one of us unique. God has made every one of you up there in the in youth in the balcony. We've got a big group of you. And Alex, I'm including you in the youth up in the balcony group. We've got a good group up there. And, and I've been telling them over the past couple of weeks, God has made you unique. Amen? And God has a gift that he's given you that came with the Holy Spirit. And I, we have some world changers up there, some people who are absolutely going to change the world. But here's the deal. The way they're going to change the world, they're going to be walking on the foundation that, and the model and the example that we set before them. I believe, and I've told you, and I'm going to lead this church in, until, it, until I, I, I just can't do it anymore to understand that we have a calling that God has given us in Farmville. We're not called to just come and gather on Sunday mornings and have a one-hour worship service and that be it. We are called to save lives. Not that we save them, but that God saves them, people through us. 
There are people all over this town, all over this city, all over this county and the adjacent counties who don't know what's going to happen in the coming years because of the ministry that we're going to do. Am I speaking hopefully? Am I preaching hopefully? Am I trying to cast a vision? Yes, I am. But I believe it. I believe that we are God's plan A for humanity. We saw the atrocities in that video that occurred in Afghanistan. We are, we are God's plan A for all of humanity. We are to be the good news people. The people who experience and model resurrection in their lives. So I don't know what you've been through. I don't know where you've come from. I don't know, I don't know how many axes you've thrown in the water. Dropped behind, left behind, put in somebody else's hand. But you're responsible for the way that you shape the future. And I hope that you know the axe that God has given you. Because we're about to swing it into a tree. Amen? What is your tree? We're going to switch gears now from the spiritual gift. And we're going to go back and think about some of those things that we are just naturally inclined to do. Some of our passions and how those work together. But we're going to go to the scriptures first to frame it theologically. And I want to invite you to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Verse 12 through 27. And we read part of this last week. We're going to read it again. um, And we're going to mine a little bit from it. Paul says this. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by... Help me. One spirit, so as to form... Whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, we are all given the... One spirit to drink, right? There's one Holy Spirit. I talked about this last week, that like Johnny didn't get a different spirit than Linda got, okay? And, 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 and Gina didn't get a different spirit than uh, Kelly got, just picking some, some folks out, okay? No one's been sleeping on the job. I'm not calling those kind of names out today, okay? So don't worry about it. But y'all get it, right? We, we haven't been given a different... We've all been given the same Holy Spirit through the one baptism. When, 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 when we go and we're baptized... That's, we, we tend to in our, in, in, in here, in, in especially in, in, in our culture, we, sent, we tend to be so individualized that we don't see the, the family and the corporate entity, the body. We don't see ourselves so easily as the body. We see one person being baptized. We, don't, we, we, we have a hard time of understanding that that's actually, there's such deep connections when a person walks through the waters of baptism that we're experiencing together. We are more connected than we, than we understand or would, would, really under, would really come to know apart from the body, seeing ourselves as the body of Christ. All right, verse 14. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving great honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is part of it. Tell your neighbor real quick, you're the body of Christ. Put it in the comments for those online. You are the body of Christ. You're the body of Christ. I don't need to say it again, but I'm going to say it again. God has given you, though, he's given you an axe, and it's not the same axe that your neighbor has. It's not the same. It it doesn't look just like the person beside you, but God has given you spiritual gifts if you've put your faith in Jesus Christ. And there's a tree for you to chop down. There's a tree, a place for you to use your spiritual gift. And and the first thing I want to say this morning is there's not just one place. There's not just one place. I want to start with those things that are outside maybe of what we would consider the church. 
you know, we consider things that happen at the church or things that happen on this block, in, on these premises, or in the youth building across the street. Wherever you go, there are trees to be worked on, trees for you to use your spiritual gifts on. I want us to go back and think about those things, those interests, those special interests that we have. You know, those, those, those hobbies, those places where we do have passion. And God has given us, God has given us uh, maybe earthly gifts to, to enjoy and, 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 and to use in those areas. That is one of, those are one of some of the places that God has called us to use our gifts. Other places that God has called us to use our gifts are right here in the church. We do what we've done, especially over the past couple of decades, that during which uh, a majority of which over the past two decades I've been a minister. I've I've been in a lot of churches, served in a lot of churches, and we do a lot of encouraging folks to be the hands and feet of Christ outside of the building. We've done so much of that that we've forgotten to remind people to be the hands and feet of Christ inside the building. So I want to tell you this morning: you have trees that are outside of the church, but you also have trees that are here. The second thing I'll say is that your trees, just as your axe isn't like everyone else's, your trees are not like everyone else's. Your trees are are, are totally different. Some of you might work on the same tree from time to time, but you have a, a different place. Each person has a different place to use their gifts. Third, God's desire is that you actively chop on your tree to grow and bear fruit. You have to be using your gift. You have to use your gifts in certain areas in order to bear fruit. This morning we shared you know, an example of one of the trees that is going to be existing here in, in the near future in our area. And some people are very, they're moved. They, they, they feel the spirit of God like giving them goosebumps and they can imagine themselves being involved in that. And for other people it might scare you a little bit. Like, How is that going to happen? And so it might not be your tree, but there are people, and I've, again I've talked to several in our church who heard about this opportunity, several who weren't able to be at the meeting last week and called me up to ask what it was about. And in the course of the conversation, I can hear, I can hear the excitement. I can hear the passion. I can hear them, and, and, and God is giving them a vision of a place to use the spiritual gifts that, they have, that, that God has given them for building up the kingdom of God, for sharing love with people whose own people turn on them. God's desire is that we use our gift. Oftentimes, I think that what happens is we look at the tree and we think it's too big. And so we assume that someone has a bigger axe and that they should be the one to chop it down. Think about it in our church. I, I, I pray that, you know, I've been talking about, I put in the newsletter article for February. I know I've been speaking prophetically about it, but I pray the day is coming sooner rather than later. When pandemic's not part of our vocabulary, when Wednesdays and, and Sundays are completely open again, when we're able to restore ministries. But I'm going to tell you, what we need is leaders. What we need is people who will start swinging their axes again. But the temptation is this. The temptation is to say, okay, well, this is the axe or the axes that God has given me, and it's just... It's not as sharp as it once was, and maybe this person of air, they, they, they got like a, they got a, a newer looking axe. It's a little shinier, might be a little sharper. We'll talk about sharpening the axe next week. And then we look at, at the tree, and we just think that my best days may be, may be behind me. I don't have the energy for that. That's how houses don't get built, right? Any of you work in construction? It takes wood to build a house, doesn't it? Someone's got to fall some trees in order to build something. In our final week of, our, of this series, we're going to talk about what God is building. But let me encourage you this morning. Don't only figure out what your axe is, but decide that you're going to work on that tree. We have a tree in our backyard, don't we, Gina? It's a sick tree. We, were ho- we have a tree, right? If you drive by our house, you'll see right in the middle of our backyard, there's, like a, there's an oak tree out there. It's probably about this big around. And, um, and we noticed when we moved in the house in July, by the end of August, all the leaves had fallen out of it. And we're like, this isn't good because all the other trees look fine. And so uh, we, we ended up having um, Hunter Toller come out and uh, take a look at it. And he's like, yeah, that tree's got to come down. And so um, 
he told us some things we could do, like some, you know, trying to put some uh, fertilizer around it and everything. But within, before we could even do that, within a month, a windstorm came and like broke like the top of the tree out. And just, I mean, it's just, it looks bad. It looks real bad. But the guy in me doesn't want to get somebody else to chop this tree down. Do you understand, guys? I want to chop it down because I want to, I want to see it fall because I knocked it down. Now, I might have to get Hunter to come and help pick it up after that and, like, grind the stump down. But I just can't imagine standing there and watching somebody else cut the tree down when I could do it with this very axe right here. You see where I'm going with this? Gina's like, three guys in the house driving her crazy all the time. So, but here's the deal. I don't know if the tree when it falls down, if it's going to hit the house or not. And I don't have a way to measure it. Well, I didn't think I did. This past week, um, the, the man who, who formerly lived in our house, uh, Mark, many of y'all know him, he came by to show us how to turn off the, the water because uh, our water to our barn kept freezing and we didn't know there was a shutoff valve. So I was telling him about the sermon series I was preaching, getting ready to preach, and and about the tree and my desire to chop it down. And I would love to get some footage of like chopping it down for y'all for next week. But I know, I know. She, again. So I was talking to him though about, I don't, know, I don't know where to put it in the yard, where to fall it. You know, I don't want to hit the pigeon loft. And I don't know if it's going to hit the house. He said, oh, it's simple. This is what you do. He said, you go up, go up to the tree and you measure about five or six feet up. Just keep in mind what, where you measure. Put a, just put you a line there with some spray paint. And then, and then he took me to the front yard. And he said, stand back here. He said, and take a pencil. And put the pencil where the top of that mark is at five feet. And then put your thumb at the bottom of the tree. He said, and then just count how many you go up like that, all the way up to the top of the tree. And then add about five feet to that number. He said, that ought to be. I said, is that an engineering thing? He said, nah, I think it'll work. though." So... But it got me thinking, it got me thinking, how many times, how many times do we have, we know how God's made us, and there's an opportunity before us to use it, but we think it's just way too big, the tree's way too big, the opportunity is way too big, the calling is way too big, I could never be a teacher to that class, those children might not like me, I feel so out of touch for the youth, I'm too old to go on a mission trip. I should have done this a long time ago. Whatever it is, fill in the blank. We look at the tree and we assume that it's way too big, but we don't understand that God just wants us to start chopping. He wants us to start working on it. And maybe it'll take some planning. Maybe it'll take stepping back. Maybe it will take another person to come in and probably do a much safer job than I would. <laughs> maybe it'll take somebody to come into your life to walk alongside of you to teach you, to tell you, look, to encourage you, to tell you, you may not feel like you have the skills and the gifts completely now, but you will grow into them. Like I told you, I believe that God has a wonderful future for First Baptist Church. I believe that God is going to grow our influence and in our ministries. I've told you again and again that the way we seek God individually affects the way we seek Him and experience His movement corporately. And a big part of that is using the spiritual gifts that God has given us. We need leaders. We need teachers. We need people who have gifts of administration and missions and, and have the ability to discern things where others may not have that ability. We need people who are so good at evangelism and aren't scared or, and, and, and afraid to share their faith with people that they don't know. People have, who, who have the courage to exhort other people. To stand with another person and say, you know what, things might not be going great in your life. These might be some of the reasons. This is how you can work through that. People who have the great gift of faith. People who have the gift of giving. God has given them much and they're able to give much in return. People who have the gift of healing, of helping. People who have the gift of hospitality. People who have the gift of knowledge and of leadership and of mercy. People who, who, who can stand with other people and be prophets in their lives. Again, not like, you know crazy prophecy but just saying you know look this is how you're living this is where this leads let's 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 work through some of this let's live a different way people who have the gift of serving and of teaching and of shepherding and of wisdom 
Here's the thing. We won't, we won't experience the fruit that God has in store, the, His will for us in, in, in growing the church unless we become active and using our axe on the tree. I want to close with one scripture this morning that has been, uh, been on my mind for a couple of weeks now. It comes from Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. And uh, this is a section of scripture where Jesus is teaching about the kingdom of God, what the kingdom of God is like. And one thing I know about living a life is that when you have spiritual gifts and you enjoy a lot of things, it's very easy to feel like, well, I need to use these gifts everywhere. And it's very easy to spread yourself so thin that you're not actually effective anywhere. You follow, you follow with me? Like, I've experienced that in my life. Gina and I talk about that. She counsels me a lot. That's one of, that's one of her spiritual gifts is, 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 is she uses it in, in counseling. And, um, sometimes we can spread ourselves so thin that we're not effective at all. And so there's a need to focus. There's a need to focus. And I want to encourage you this morning to find that place where you're called to focus right now. There could be a ministry that you're involved in that's outside of the walls of the church, and it's vital. But I also know there are many ministry opportunities and needs that our church is going to have in the coming days that are absolutely vital. I want to encourage you to, to figure out where you need to concentrate and the areas you need to sell. What I mean is this, Matthew 13, 44. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Jesus gives this parable of this man who, who, who in a, of the kingdom of God, like this man who was in a field and he found this great treasure in it. And so he hides it, goes and sells everything, buys the field so that he can have the treasure. We're humans, we enjoy life, hopefully, the life that God has given you. But we don't have infinite resources. We don't have infinite hours in a day. We're all given the same 24 hours in a day. We're all given spiritual gifts. We all have calling. I want to encourage you this morning to find the place, the tree that God is calling you to right now, and use your energy to actually chop it down. Don't put a cut in it here and there. You can never build a house. You can never build a house unless the tree fell. And God is calling us to fall trees. Amen? I'm going to have a prayer as the claim comes up. God, we thank you so much for, uh, for the calling you've given to us. Lord, I thank you for our church and I thank you for our future. And I pray that we will find ourselves walking into it and being who you're calling us to be. And I pray that you would encourage folks this morning. I believe your Holy Spirit goes before and does encourage us. And I pray you would give people strength and, and vision to be able to, to see where the spiritual gifts they've been given meet the great need in the world and great opportunities. It may be in some of the things they're passionate about. It may be in some of the ministry opportunities that we have at the church. But I pray that, that, that they, will, they will find that there is great joy to be had in living a life that is that is an overflow of your gifts. I pray for our congregation. I pray for, for people to continue making movement toward you. I know there are people in our church who are putting their faith in you and renewing their faith in you. I, I pray for those who have come to faith recently to come, uh, to have courage to, to, to come and stand and, and share with the church their, their new faith. I pray for those who may feel a call to rededicate their lives to you. I pray for for them to have courage to step into that this morning. And I pray for those who uh, may feel the call to, to make it official and, and to join by covenant relationship this family of faith. I pray to this morning as we have an invitation time that they would have courage to make a movement toward you and to what you're doing in their lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we have uh, this, the, the closing song this morning, Another in the Fire. Uh, like we did last week, we'll have a, a time of invitation where if, if you feel moved by the Spirit of God to make a public declar declaration of the faith that you're, you've placed in Jesus.
and, and, and you know, that you want to be baptized and join this family of faith, I want to invite you to come to the front row during this song. Um, if you want to rededicate your life to do the same, and maybe you've decided that this is going to be your home church. You're not currently a member. You have faith in Jesus. You're going to move it from somewhere else. And I want to invite you this morning, in, in whatever way you come, uh, following the song, Johnny will continue uh, playing if there's anyone down here, and, and I'll come and receive you, and then we will share with the church and, and celebrate together. Another die for me. There is an 
This morning, I stand here with Billy Weaver, who has professed faith in Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit has been dwelling in my brother here for quite a while, and we've, we, we've, we've noticed that. We've had some talks about that, and um, he comes this morning to make his faith public. Um, to, we'll be scheduling him to go through the waters of baptism, and this morning, as he's making this public declaration of faith, he's coming to also become a member of First Baptist Church. And so as, as, we, as you've witnessed already, when we do this, uh, when we become family like this, we walk in covenant relationship with one another. And so we're going to do this covenant uh, this morning, and then we will be uh, scheduling a time for your baptism. And um, following uh, uh, worship this morning, I'm sure you'd like to come and, and say welcome to Billy. So um, I'd like to uh, remind you of that invitation and ask you to stand right up here. So um, as a member of this family... Billy, will you support the mission and ministry of First Baptist Church with your presence, prayers, and service as the Holy Spirit grants you gifts to follow Jesus Christ as his disciple? If so, please indicate by saying, I will. I will. And to the church, will you, members of First Baptist Church, pledge your support to Billy by offering your presence, prayers, and service to him as the Holy Spirit leads you? Will you promise to surround him with a community of love and grace that he may grow as a disciple of Christ and be found faithful in his service to others? And will you model authentic discipleship and offer him guidance and nurture while receiving guidance and nurture from him? If so, please indicate by saying, I will. Amen. Christy, I'd like to ask you to come and stand beside your husband. And again, in just a few moments, uh, uh, following uh, the benediction, I'd like to invite you to come and welcome Billy to our family of faith. I'd also like to welcome Alex Corbett up this morning. Alex and I have, uh, have been talking a little bit lately, and he wants to come this morning and rededicate his life to Christ. Um, Alex is, is a man who knows and loves the Lord greatly. And, and he's also, uh, I remember I, I was here for about just a couple weeks, and he uh, came knocking on the door one afternoon about 4 o'clock, and uh, he said, I want to sit down and talk to you. 
And we had a meeting with the Lord, didn't we? He shared his testimony, testimony with me of how the Lord has worked in his life. In fact, you, gave, you brought me a paper soon after that um, of a testimony you had written. And um, Alex has been through battles with cancer. Um, he's currently going through a battle, battle with cancer right now. And um, he's endured and, and beat cancer quite a few times in his life. And as a result of that, uh, the Lord has, has, has bore a lot of fruit through you, my friend. And, um, and through your testimony and through your witness to his faithfulness, persevering in the midst of, of great trial and great difficulty. And so I want to commend you for that. And also recognize, you know, in the midst of this current battle you're facing right now and you coming to rededicate your life, um, we stand with you in this decision and we support you and want to offer you encouragement and prayer. So I want to actually um, ask you if you would stand uh, this morning as as Alice is coming and rededicating his life, I want us to have a, a special prayer over him um, in, in the current battle that you're facing. And, um, and following the benediction, would you like for folks to come by? And I, I know with the immune, immune stuff, uh, maybe come by and wave to you from a little bit of a distance. So, but I'm going I'm to put my, my hand on my brother here, and I want you to join your hearts with me. If you want to put a hand out towards him, you can. God, I thank you so much for Alex. I thank you for what you've done in his life the way that you've shone brightly through his life, the ways that he's used his spiritual gifts in, in service of your kingdom and the ways that it has, it has borne a lot of fruit for the kingdom of God and for First Baptist Church. Lord, we know that he's been through a lot, especially with cancer, and, and he's experienced remission several times, and we give you thanks for that. Uh, we know that he's undergoing a battle right now, and Lord, we pray for healing. We pray for, for, uh, for peace. We pray for... Uh, the different uh, therapies he's getting right now to, uh, to, to be very effective. And, and, uh, and, and we pray that, that you would, um, would give him many days with, with his family and with this family of faith. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the great love that he has uh, for this church and for you. And, uh, and we pray that, that he would find many ways to be able to use exactly what you have given him. So as he comes this morning, Lord, we, we join him in lifting him up and, and praying for for deliverance from, from this and, and for healing for his body. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. And Lord, we also give you thanks for Billy. We give you thanks for the decision that he has made uh, to, to place faith in you and to make that public. We thank you for all that you're doing in he and Christy's lives and, and in their marriage together and how it's, it's producing a witness of you for, for so many. We pray that you would uh, continue to, uh, to show him uh, pat, his path forward and, um, and we pray that he would be um, a, a forerunner for many others in, in our family of faith and in the surrounding community um, who, who desire a relationship uh, with you. So we give you thanks, Lord, for this time of worship, and we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. May you go in peace. Amen. Love you, brother. Love you, brother.